Good afternoon and good morning to those who are joining us out on the West Coast. I'm Trina Sheets, Executive Director of the National Emergency Management Association. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Pandemics and Preparing for the Next Big Thing Using Modeling and Technology. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the webinar, Sean McSpaden. Sean is Executive Director of the National Information Sharing Consortium. Sean, thank you for being with us today and serving as moderator, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Trina. Um, as uh, Trina indicated, uh, I'm Sean McSpaden. Uh, first, I, I want to thank the National Emergency Management so Association for the opportunity to moderate uh, today's session. Um, I, and I also want to welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, this We should have a great uh, um, session this afternoon and uh, you know with, with uh, very important information shared by our featured speakers uh, just to set the stage uh, for today's conversation um, as many of you know models uh, have taken center stage in many key policy decisions around COVID-19 um, you know first due to the unprecedented nature of the pandemic but also because of the many uncertainties about the spread of the, of the disease uh, and the way ahead uh, and the need to make informed decisions uh, now on how, how best to manage that path forward in the future. Uh, as you also know, tribal, regional, state, and local governments across the nation are using uh, models and, and the underlying technology that support them to shape their health system responses as the virus spreads in their communities. Uh, researchers are using models to estimate important epidemiological characteristics of the disease, such as the incubation period, transmissibility, uh, and severity, as well as the likely impacts of different public health interventions, such as social distancing, stay-at-home orders, travel restrictions, and contra contact tracing. While clearly models can be important tools for understanding uh, this, this novel disease uh, and the policy responses uh, to it, their approaches and assumptions vary widely and can give widely divergent results. Uh, with no other factors considered, uh, the, the exact characteristics and spread of a novel virus and the human behavior of nearly 350 million people under stress are simply very hard to predict, predict with, any ac with any level of accuracy. Uh, with that brief setup, it's my great pleasure to introduce the primary speakers for today's webinar. Uh, first, we have Dr. Sid Bacham, who serves as a manager for emerging technologies at IEM, and also Dr. Joseph Green, who serves as the director of applied science and also a, a science advisor for the Pacific Disaster Center. At this point, I'd like to turn things over to Sid Bacham. Uh, Sid, take it away. All right, thanks so much, Sean, and thank you to Nima for inviting me to uh, participate in this webinar. As Sean said, you know, we want to kind of get to the meat of the matter. So uh, real quickly, we'll kind of talk a little bit about how we got to where we are and some of the uh, things that inspired us to create our COVID model. And then uh, one of the challenges that we're running into, and I'm sure a lot of disease modelers are, is really trying to capture uh, resurgence as we see it uh, across the country. Uh, and then finally, we want to hit a little bit on a uh, new ca uh, capability that we have, and that is trying to make projections on peak hospital demand, uh, as those uh, type of information really is, is important for uh, people to respond to this kind of uh, challenge. So uh, first of all, we're really excited. Uh, some of the news coverage that we've had in recent months, uh, so at the beginning of April, we spoke with uh, some folks down in Bradenton, Florida, they had seen some of our COVID-19 projections. Uh, you know, we had stated uh, in one of our projections that they would hit a certain number by the weekend, and uh, we came pretty close. So, you know, they gave us a call and talked to us and wanted to learn a little bit more about our models. Uh, and then just two weeks ago, uh, Time Magazine put out a little article. Uh, the, uh, the person there, David Cox, uh, reached out to us and actually told us that, you know, the folks in South Korea were inspired by some of our work nine years ago when it came to developing uh, plans for points of dispensing or pods. And those were kind of some of the uh, ideas that they used when they designed their drive-through testing for, for COVID. 
So that was really exciting for us. So uh, before I joined IEM, I did a postdoc at Los Alamos National Labs. There we did some modeling um, for anthrax and smallpox and so on. And that really kind of catapulted uh, me in my uh, career. So after joining IEM, we uh, started right away in 2003 working with the Department of Health and Human Services. We helped support their anthrax modeling working group. Uh, and since that time, we've been supporting HHS. I'd like to say that we supported BARDA before BARDA was created in 2006. Um, and, uh, you know, during that time, we created models, disease models, uh, for all the category A biological agents and some of the category B agents. Uh, some of our modeling was actually presented to the uh, Executive Office of the President in 2008. And then in 2009, we did support HHS with the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, uh, something I think we all realize is a different beast than what we're dealing with with COVID right now. So when we supported HHS, uh, you know, it all started off with uh, your typical uh, model simulations, analyses, write r reports for uh, the decision makers, uh, develop PowerPoint presentations for decision makers, uh, but HHS came to us and said, you know, even though your reports and analyses are great and your PowerPoints are great, we're still having issues, you know, trying to get the most important points to decision makers. So they actually asked us to start thinking about and developing visualization tools, so decision support tools. And so you can see some examples here on this slide. Uh, you know, we created tools to help them examine how could we better use smallpox vaccine so that we wouldn't have severe adverse uh, reactions. We help them create um, some, some travel tracking uh, models. So if people were exposed to a contagious disease in one location, and then based on typical travel patterns, where might they move and seed other um, outbreaks in other locations? So these were all very complex models. We worked with very smart folks, interagency uh, efforts, within HHS, you know, involving people from CDC, NIH, DOD, all the alphabet soup organizations. And, uh, you know, we created these complex models uh, based on a lot of assumptions and input from SMEs. And we, we did a lot of what-if scenarios to help people plan. And that's what we did for years and years to support HHS. Uh, but one thing we learned um, as soon as we started with COVID we learned that that approach just wouldn't work uh, just because we didn't know a lot of information about COVID. So we kind of turned the problem on its head and approached it from a different uh, perspective. So the analogy that, that we'd like to use is kind of like hurricane modeling. Uh, there are some people who want to develop long range models and forecast. So for example, the Hurricane Center uh, came out with their prediction just a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, they're predicting the number of named storms and hurricanes and ma major hurricanes that are going to happen this summer uh, and into this fall. But uh, IEM's philosophy really is to actually make, make it simple, keep it uh, simple, and then make the, uh, the data that we provide actionable to people. So instead of looking at an entire hurricane season, we just wanted to pick one single hurricane and we wanted to create a short-term projection, just seven days. And we wanted to make sure that this was really actionable for people at the state and at, at the county level. Um, you know, based on our emergency management background, we know that all disasters uh, are, are local and all responses are local. So, you know, people uh, living in Miami, Dade County in Florida, you know, they don't care what's happening in, in North Carolina and how the hurricanes are, are gonna impact them. They wanna know what's going to go, go on in their own backyard. So that really was the, the impetus to our, our modeling. So I like to uh, put things in simple terms. So this is my uh, homage to, uh, to Mater um, from the Cars movie. Uh, so he would say, I know where I'm going because I know where I've been. So to translate that, that means that the future projections that we're providing or creating are really based on the actual past data. So in this case with COVID, we're looking at the cumulative confirmed cases. If we know what those look like and how we got there, that's really gonna help us better project the future cases that we're gonna see. So the important part of our model is that we don't assume that the secondary number of infections caused by a single contagious person is gonna stay the same over time. 
So this number you've probably seen uh, called a lot of different things. We call it the R value. Other people will call it the R naught. Uh, other people will call it the transmission rate. Um, but we know from past experience, going back and looking at the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa and in 2009, that the transmission rate is just not going to stay the same over time. Um, and as I said earlier, we knew we couldn't create a complex model uh, like we had before in the past with HHS because there's just too many unknowns and you'd have to be making assumptions upon assumptions um, and we couldn't do that. So we used uh, a real simple disease model, an SEIR type model. Again, that stands for susceptible, exposed. Those are people who are not contagious, infected. Those are people who are contagious and then recovered or removed. Those are people who have, have died or, or recovered. So we created a, a simple disease model and we augmented that by looking at hospitalizations also. We wanted to be able to inform people how many people might require hospitalization, how many people might require ICU care, and then even people who might need me mechanical ventilators. We used, uh, uh, created uh, an AI artificial intelligence model to kind of look backward. Um, what we had been doing in the past to support HHS was really creating models and kind of pushing them forward to do a bunch of what-if scenarios. Uh, in this case, uh, like I said, we wanted to look backward. So if you look at the hurricane picture, we kind of wanted to go, uh, if you look at the picture from right to left, there's three windows that we want to look at. There's the very early on window that shows the track of the hurricane, and then you get to the more recent uh, path of the hurricane that's all information that is more relevant to us. And then finally, the last window is there on the left. That's the projection. That's what everyone's interested in. Where are we going to go uh, with a hurricane? How many new cases of COVID are we going to see? So in order for us to look backward, we actually run 11 million simulations for every single jurisdiction. So whether that's a state or a county, uh, we run 11 million runs to find the best model parameters that would actually fit the real data. Again, that data was confirmed. COVID cases. Once we do that, just like in a hurricane model, we find the best uh, model parameters that we can, and then we run the model forward, and we project thousands of run, runs. Uh, so you get a spaghetti model, kind of uh, like you've seen in hurricane models before, and you get a cone of uncertainty. So you can see here uh, the projections that we, we've been making typically have been within 20% or often within 10% of the actual confirmed cases. Here you get two examples, Lee County, Alabama. And you see here, that's 3,000, over 3,000 spaghetti plots going forward. And you can see there, most of those plots are all parallel and they don't diverge. So those are gonna be really convergent and they're gonna have a nice uh, cone of uncertainty. And we know we have high confidence of where that's gonna go. On the, uh, the right-hand side, Polk County, Iowa, you can see there that's quite different. You can see that we've got different arcs and, and different trajectories. And so there, the cone of uncertainty is gonna be much wider because uh, you know, you've got that growth of new cases and they're not uh, settling down yet. So since March 31st, uh, IEM has been doing daily runs. Uh, we've been doing these short-term seven-day projections. We've been doing them for all 50 US states and territories and over now we're over 360 counties across the country um, and we put these out as a pdf file uh, you can see some of the products here both graphically and in table format and this is all done uh, gratis so i just want to show you just some of the projections that we've done in the past so uh, this one is for the state of texas uh, again when we do our projections we, we show the entire state but then we also do show individual counties within in the state so here's a projection that we made uh, for the state of Texas. Uh, the actual data ended on April 17th, and you can see those plotted in the blue dots and the blue line. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the projections. Uh, you can see the projections going from April uh, 18th out seven days. Uh, the open circles are the projections. And um, I added the uh, red triangles there so that you can see what the actual data turned out to be and the numbers are provided there in the table. And you can see at the very beginning, uh, you know, we, we did very well, 99.8% on the first day. And as we go out, uh, that uh, went out to about 89.8%. So fairly good um, 
consistency in terms of projections, you know, projecting cases out seven days. So as I said, we also do this at the county level. So here's an example from the state of Ohio. So you can see the counties that, that we do. In this case, the, the actual data stops uh, May uh, 11th, and then we project out a week. And so I just provided you with, with one set of actual case data. So there on May 18th, uh, just a couple days ago, we have the projected numbers, and then we have the actual numbers. And you can see a couple of them we did very well. Uh, Lucas County, for example, we were off by one, one single case. Uh, and so that one, uh, we've got 99.9% .9 accuracy uh, for that projection. And overall, we did pretty well. The average accuracy uh, coming out about 95%. So in addition to some of the uh, state and locals uh, that we're working with, we've also reached out and, and been working with the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, or MWCOG. Uh, we've worked very closely with them, and uh, so we provide them a little map um, that shows you know, their actual confirmed cases on the left uh, with the number of cases, and then on the right uh, image there, the projected cases a week later. So those projections are, are used daily. Uh, they're sent out to the National Capital Region Watch Desk, and they send it out to other folks, uh, including the Joint Task Force, uh, NCR, and that's shared with the DOD medical uh, community. And uh, working with them, you know, they really emphasize the need to make decisions early. So uh, they asked if they could get out instead of just one week in, in the future, if we could project out two weeks. Um, so we worked with them and we actually started projecting out three weeks for them. Uh, and they've been very uh, grateful so that they could make some of their medical decisions based on our projections. So this is what I alluded to earlier. Uh, one of the challenges uh, with disease models, your typical disease models, if you looked at new daily cases, you imagine a bell-shaped curve, the number of new cases goes up, hits a peak and comes back down. Um, what we're seeing with COVID is that, you know, we've, we've had these very severe social distancing uh, policies. And uh, now that they're starting to ease up on some of those social distancing policies, we've seen resurgence in cases. And uh, for a lot of disease models, that's very hard for them to capture. So let me start off in the bottom left-hand corner there. This one graph is gonna serve two pur purposes. So on April 22nd, you know, we projected out to the 29th and uh, we projected 6,000 some cases and the actual uh, reported was just under 6,000. So just a 6% difference, we did pretty well. And so uh, on April 29th, we felt pretty confident that moving forward seven days later that, that our projections would do pretty well. We projected uh, about 7,000 cases on May 6th. And uh, what happened was the actual cases was much higher than that, about 8,500 and it's even outside of the uh, upper bounds that we have. So that's that uh, red square that, that's indicated in the graph there. So what happened was that between the 29th, uh, after the 29th of April, we had a resurgence in cases. And so you'll see that in the couple slides near the top, the top center on, on May 2nd. And this is why we do it every day is because uh, we know that things can happen and things can change. And so on May 2nd, uh, our updated projections for May 9th were uh, 8,900, and the, the actual came out to be uh, 9,500. So we were only off by 6.5%. Um, and then um, just a day later, again, uh, the model uh, updated. And on May 3rd, we projected that on May 10th, we would have about 9,500. Uh, actual, we were off by by about uh, 300 cases or about 3%. So again, uh, our model was able to capture the resurgence. Uh, and that's something that's I think very important to decision makers is to realize uh, when new cases are gonna pop up. And this is the, the last slide that I have. Uh, one of the new things that we've been doing is working with uh, a couple locations, uh, namely the state of Georgia, and as well as uh, we worked with Texas to look at peak hospital demand. And so you can see here uh, two slides on the left. Um, they have trauma service areas, uh, TSAs, 
and uh, across the state. And what we were able to do was improve our algorithm, not by trying to find the current R value, but trying to fit the change in the R value that we were observing. So uh, in order to project hospital demand and hospital need, we made some very simple assumptions. You can see on the slide there, uh, we assumed based on data, uh, as much data as we could find, that 20% of all confirmed cases are gonna require hospitalization. Uh, CDC put out a nice study in March that 24% of all hospitalized cases require ICU care. And then finally, of those people that are in ICU, uh, our assumption is about half of them are gonna require mechanical ventilators. So these are all, again, very broad assumptions and, and we can work with jurisdiction specific data and improve on these assumptions. And, and based on all these assumptions, we can show uh, the slides on the left there. Again, the blue dots represent actual data in terms of new cases daily. And then the blue dotted line is our projection of new uh, daily cases. And then the red lines uh, indicate the number of hospitalized cases uh, that we expect. So you notice that the, the peak of the hospitalized cases uh, occurs a little bit later than the peak of new cases, and it's a little bit higher. And, and that's due to the fact that these people when they go to the hospital, they're staying in the hospital on average anywhere from eight to 12 days. So um, those are some of the projections. The top figure there shows a case where the trauma service area, the uh, new cases hasn't peaked yet. And then the bottom one shows uh, a case where the new cases have already peaked and in the future, they're gonna start going down. All right, so uh, that's all that I have for now and I'll look forward to uh, taking questions at the end. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sid. Uh, what an excellent presentation. Uh, we're going to move uh, quickly uh, to our second presenter, uh, Dr. Joseph Green. Uh, Joe, uh, why don't you uh, carry us forward to the Q&A portion of the webinar? All right. Thanks, Sean. And thank you, Sid, for that wonderful presentation. And I'd also like to thank Nima uh, for having me here today. So I thought I would start today with a brief overview of PDC for those of you who aren't familiar with us and what we do. Also, it's my hope in understanding PDC's mission and goals, it can help frame the discussion regarding the use of modeling and emergency management moving forward. We're an applied research center managed by the University of Hawaii. We have a diverse range of partner projects, engagements across the globe. So we're continuously developing and leveraging new technologies and refining best practices to help partners across the globe effectively mitigate, prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters. So our focus at PDC is to foster resilience through the use of science and technology. And by doing this, we, it's our hope that we're helping executives and disaster managers worldwide to make informed decisions to reduce disaster risk and prepare for and respond to disasters. This is just a brief overview of some of the organizations who rely on PDC's partnership to get actionable information into the hands of decision makers rapidly. You can see we have a very diverse set of uh, partners that we work with here. So this slide is kind of how PDC envisions itself. One thing is clear um, here, we're looking at having two different kind of groups that need to communicate both pre and during and after an emergency. So we have the scientific community, uh, which is where I originally come from, whose audience are largely, you know, their peers, peer review, um, making decisions with uncertainty. There's oftentimes a low comfort. Um, you always, I, at least from my perspective and my background, when I was talking about my research findings, I was always, um, instructed and kind of trained to talk about the uncertainty up front. The vocabulary we use is often very complex in the scientific community, and we associate largely with just other technical groups. Decision makers, on the other hand, have to answer to the general public. Um, they have to make a decision with a little bit of information or a lot of information or oftentimes with no information. So therefore, there's been a development in this comfort with uncertainty. The vocabulary has has to be simple and direct. And oftentimes the, the groups and the associations that decision makers have to uh, work with and answer to are elected officials. So PDC actually envisions itself as this bridge between the two, where we can take the complexity 
of the scientific terminology, the comfort with uncertainty, and translate that for decision makers so they can make quick, actionable uh, information. So this slide is, is quite complex. Um, and we did this on purpose because one thing is clear is as emergency managers, we're expected to be experts in epidemiology, seismology, hydrology, et cetera, simultaneously, all, all at once. But in reality, what you need is to be a disaster manager and emergency manager. Uh, our mission then is to guide action with defensible science. So to achieve this, we take an integrated approach whereby we can bring in data from the latest observational and collection systems, visualizations, GIS platforms, computing platforms, communication technologies, you know, advanced modeling to support informed decision making. So to overcome some of the challenges in decision making, practitioners need tools that will allow for the anticipation of needs and the understanding of these complex situations, like vulnerabilities to a hazard, for example. So the technology that PDC has developed is called Disaster Aware. Uh, you can see the uh, links here. It's also available on pdc.org. It's free access. Uh, there's a disaster alert application that's free to the general public. And as emergency managers, you will have access to EMOPS, which is a little bit more uh, focused and includes a, a broader uh, level of information. This is the means by which we provide the capability for analysis and insight. This is a multi-hazard platform. And what we do is we leverage this for our mission set to guide decision making across all hazards. So what I thought I'd do now is walk you through the platform with some examples from COVID and other hazards. So one of the things that's become clear to us at PDC is for at least the near term and possibly beyond, modeling is going to be you know, a necessary component to assess you know, not just the potential impact of a hazard, but whether or not we can, should, or and how we can respond to a hazard. Um, one of the examples that was discussed um, with some stakeholders just recently on another uh, teleconference was a response scenario in the Pacific Islands. So you can look at this from one of two ways. One, there are some islands with very low to no case numbers. So if a tropical cyclone were to impact one of those islands is the risk of potentially introducing covid worth the response um, conversely if you have an island that is greatly impacted by covid is it worth risking uh, your personnel to send them to respond so these uh, types of information uh, these types of decisions have to be based on information and modeling particularly of covid case numbers projections uh, like sid uh, showed earlier are gonna be very important to make these decisions. Um, quite frankly, we had some decision makers saying, we're not going in until we can look at a bunch of different models and determine whether or not we can actually go in safely. So modeling can give a good idea before boots are on the ground and what can be done. Um, oftentimes this can actually pre pre excuse me, prevent unnecessarily deploying and responding. Uh, an example a couple years ago was uh, there was a dam break, I think, in Laos, and PDC pulled model, models from different experts together, were able to present those to the government, and the government decided that they would stand down. Uh, they were getting requests from uh, international partners to come in and respond, and they actually didn't need to do that. So you can imagine how valuable that type of decision would be given the current situation with COVID. So back to disaster aware, we present information in four main formats. Uh, there are others, but the key ones are layers, hazards, reports, and products. So hazards, which we see here, are real-time auto-generated or manually, manually created hazards. Now these provide a quick snapshot of the location, severity, and potential impact of a variety of hazards. We include natural, technological, man-made, health, and other hazards. Within each, are located folders uh, with planning products. These include official reports, sit reps, and background information. And you can see that here. So we tie those directly to the hazard itself, and you can see the folder structure. Oftentimes, this is automatically generated by our modeling group. Now, layers add additional grouping of uh, information. These are spatially enabled, 
data. They're specific to hazards, planning, logistics, and vulnerability. These are information that either uh, stakeholders or PDC have determined are important to situational awareness. So you can see what we have here right now for COVID was we have local uh, testing facilities on the island of Oahu. Um, so for major responses, we will actually group our layers together in, in a folder structure for ease of access, but there also will be interspersed throughout other folders as well, just to make sure that they are uh, accessible you know, when you're working during an emergency. So here we can see another set of layers. These are the confirmed active and recovered cases and deaths uh, from Johns Hopkins. So this is one example of where we can pull in data from another source directly. I think at this point, we're all pretty familiar with this data. We've seen it all over. Um, it's been incredibly useful for planners, responders, and researchers alike. However, when we combine this data with other data sets, like you see here, this is the layer for health, global healthcare capacity, the information begins to paint a bigger picture. Um, so this is PDC's Global Healthcare Capacity Index that we've put together. And what this actually shows is that countries in the lighter colors may actually show limitations in their capacity to respond to a health event. So for example, the number of skilled caregivers or de dedicated facilities. So overlaying this very quickly with COVID case numbers can give you an idea of how well a country may or may not respond. Now, as we've seen with COVID, there are a number of other factors that come into play there. So we also can use uh, disaster aware to support partners with direct requests. We've done this with NEMA. So this is a specific use case um, for data management and information. We're looking at the emergency measure status across uh, the United States. And over here on the right, you see products that will be um, linked directly to that. So as a decision maker, you may be asked you know, to make decisions across geographies, across boundaries, and knowing you know, based on you know, what we've seen with, with COVID, both within the United States and internationally, there's a lot of different measures going on. So keeping track of those while you're making a decision, looking at other models, disease numbers, et cetera, is very important to have that in one place. You don't need to go looking for it and researching that. So what we have now is, uh, a couple slides that I'd like to round out the presentation with to give an example of how the system might be used to leverage different types of model output for decision support. Um, so last week we had an earthquake in Nevada. It was a 6.5. Uh, luckily nothing, nothing came of this, but it, it got all of us thinking because at, at PDC we've, you know, we are a multi-hazard focus. So we're thinking of COVID, but also we realize you know, it's, it's tropical cyclone season, it's hurricane season, you know, earthquakes don't, you know, take the day off because there's COVID. So we're looking at you know, kind of layering these hazards and what this is going to look like. This is going to be kind of for the near term, at least, our, our future. Um, so it's one thing to deal with this earthquake during a normal time. Um, but with COVID, there's some additional considerations, obviously, we need to bring into decision making. First thing you may want to do as an emergency manager is turn on both the USGS shake map model, which is what you see here. The yellow in the center of this uh, is the more um, is the shaking intensity. So the closer you get towards the center, the higher the shaking intensity. What we've also done is we put this on top of the John Hopkins uh, case count. So we can see luckily that there are not a lot of cases there where we're seeing the most intense shaking. So thankfully there were not a lot of cases in the area. So let's just extend the, the exercise out a little bit and look at the critical care bed availability. So this is a model we're ingesting directly from Columbia University. Now you can see the little red plus there, the area that that um, earthquake fell into, uh, there's not a lot of critical care beds. In fact, that, that one, region right within there, there are no critical care beds available. So what I've done now is just overlaying the shaking intensity on top of that. So we can see again, just a little bit more clearly that the area near the greatest shaking intensity has a pretty low capacity, but there's probably more to the story. So what I've done here now, um, I ho hope you can see this, is 
overlain population density. So there may be a reason why we're not seeing any cases and where there's not a lot of capacity because there's not a lot of people there. And in fact, that is the case here. Um, so we do know this. And you know, those of you from Nevada or, or FEMA Region 9 may be saying, yeah, okay, we knew this. We knew it wasn't a major population center. But think about if you're going into a different country or an area that you're not familiar with. So I've only been to Nevada once, and that was Vegas. Surprise, surprise. So I don't know that much about it, but I've built out a story where I have a, a lot greater understanding of the situational awareness based on the different models I'm bringing them in and how I'm kind of able to toggle those and get information. Um, this reminds me of a story our executive director tells all the time. We put together a, an exposure model and a socioeconomic vulnerability model, and he presented that uh, to a, a specific decision maker within uh, the United States. Uh, African Command, so AFRICOM. And after he was done with his presentation, uh, this particular person stood up and said, you know, this is great. However, you know, I could have told you that. So why am I paying you to do this? To which our executive director asked, well, sir, how long have you been working in Africa? He goes, over 20 years. And Ray responded, uh, I've never been to Africa. So you can see the kind of the power of this if you're asked to make decisions in areas where you may not have all of the information or maybe lacking uh, information. So the following are products for actual disaster responses. I wanted to kind of highlight these to show some of our capabilities. And just imagine as we're doing these, um, how COVID-19 data is going to have to come into play moving forward. Um, so this particular product, we took different models from NOAA, National Weather Service, FEMA and PDC to come up with a maximum potential exposure for Hurricane Florence. We were seeing a lot of models for decision makers, a lot of very good models that were looking at things like tropical cyclone wind, storm surge, flooding separately. But we actually had a direct request saying, well, what if I put all of this together? What am I looking at? So we were able to take that and we pulled it into our AIM model, our all hazards impact model, that gives us a maximum potential exposure. So this model allows us to take different hazard models and intersect it uh, across different geography, geographies of the world to give maximum potential exposure. So from that, we can do breakdowns based on demographics, um, breakdown of potential needs given FEMA guidelines, uh, international guidelines, we substitute the sphere guidelines there. And this gives a quick snapshot of those that are likely to be exposed and how many of those exposed would likely be in need. So you can also see uh, we're looking at how to change this template for COVID right now. Uh, luckily, we have not had to use one yet, but we're also looking at those that would be at greatest risk uh, for COVID. So including the breakdown of those with pre-existing health conditions, um, with actual case numbers in these products. So this gives a better idea to the decision maker of what they're, actually look, what they're actually going to potentially experience on the ground. So this is an example of how PDC operates with other entities. So we look for the best models, the best modelers that we can interact with um, to get the product in the hands of decision makers. So for this example, we were looking at Tropical Storm Barry and the flooding that was potentially going to be produced there. So we work with the Pacific uh, Northwest National Laboratories, or PNNL, who does excellent flood modeling. And we were able to take their model output, combine it with our AIM exposure model to provide a greater context to decision makers. So you can see here the population exposed, the number of households that were exposed, as well as the total capital exposure uh, given that uh, flood model. And that's all I have, so thank you for your time. And I look forward to any questions or discussions that we may have. Thank you. So Dr. Green, thank you so much for, uh, again, an excellent presentation. Uh, great information from both of our presenters today. Um, at this point, we are gonna turn to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, for both of you, and certainly uh, you can pick uh, uh, you know, whether both of you would like to respond or, or if one of you uh, would like to take the lead on the, on, uh, the response. Uh, in your view, uh, what, uh, 
what approaches do you believe uh, scientists, uh, public health officials, government leaders, and, and policymakers, uh, regardless of, of jurisdictional level, uh, what, do you, what approaches do you believe they should take to, better, to ensure better, more transparent understanding of the variables, assumptions, and constraints used in these models? Uh, clearly, uh, those assumptions, constraints, and variables uh, can you know are are the heart of these models and can produce wildly different results. So uh, w would welcome your thoughts on on that uh, topic. Yeah, so maybe I'll start first. Um, you know, I think uh, just like Joe, you know, we've been doing modeling for for 20 years, and just like Joe mentioned in his his slide, you know, it's incumbent on us as modelers to actually educate the decision makers. You know, we've been doing this for, for a long time. We know the ins and outs, we know the caveats, we know the drawbacks and limitations of our models, uh, but the senior decision makers don't know that. And so it's really incumbent on us to, to educate them. You know, um, they, they, they definitely wanna be transparent, but sometimes, you know, they're up there standing in front of a microphone and somebody asks them a question, and it's hard for them in five or 10 seconds or a couple of minutes even to provide the exact answer to the question as well as the caveats. You know, if, if Joe and I had all the time in the world, we'd sit there and we'd give everybody, you know, this is, you know, uh, modeling 101 and this is what the parameters are and this is why one model might be better than another. Um, and we can give you all the caveats. And unfortunately, those uh, senior decision makers don't have that luxury. Um, so we, we do the best that we can to educate them about our models and, and our assumptions when we, when we talk to them. Um, but it's still, you know, it's difficult for them to convey all that, uh, you know, to, to reporters and to the public. Uh, so it's quite, quite a bit of challenge, I think. Yeah, thanks, Sid. I'll just echo what, what Sid has said here and just add that I think more information sharing is, is a better thing in this uh, context. Um, we do at PDC, as Sid mentioned, and, and as Sid has demonstrated, that we try as best as we can to inform the decision maker ahead of time based on whatever model we're using, the uncertainty, um, and how to communicate that. I think risk communication um, alternatively has done a, a, a good job, but could improve on how we talk about uncertainty in these models. I think with COVID, um, and understandably so, you see a lot of uh, numbers out there without the, the uncertainty around those numbers being discussed. And I think when we talk about risk communication and when we talk about what decision makers actually need in their hands, we need to, it's incumbent on people like myself and Sid to come up with new and effective ways to kind of convey that uncertainty to decision makers so they can grab that five minute, five second sound bite or that, you know, gotcha question about the, the model uncertainty. So, you know, that's one thing we're constantly aware of. And we're, we're, I think all of us are continually refining is how we discuss and how we convey uncertainty without it sounding like we don't know what we're talking about. I think that's the fear, you know, of, of the academic. If I start talking about uncertainty, then people might not think I know what I'm talking about. That's actually not the case. It, it's kind of, baked into risk communication and risk management. And I think it's really important that we do a better job of communicating that. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we, we do have an, another question, uh, this time for you, Dr. Green. Uh, you, um, in your presentation, uh, you begin, seem to begin to uh, bridge the gap between you know, the singular focus on COVID-19 uh, and the use of modeling uh, in this scenario to, you know, other scenarios, all hazards, um, emergency management use of modeling technologies uh, and modeling approaches. So the question is, how do you determine what the best model is for each of the data sets you were you uh, um, and or the the, the uh, user emergency management professional out there is trying to illustrate? That's an excellent question, and that's kind of the ongoing job, my ongoing job here at PDC, is to find, you know, the best model for the actual intended purpose. So a couple 
a couple ways we approach that. One, we look at you know comfort of the stakeholder. So the emergency manager, the decision maker, you know, what level of complexity are they comfortable with? And how does this tie into the decisions they actually need to make? Do they need a very complex model that's going to be predicting things out into the future? Or do they just need to know ballpark how many people am I looking at here? So that's kind of the first and primary driver. Um, and then, you know, quite honestly, it's situations like these, you know, uh, so now I'm, I'm familiar with Sid and Sid's work. So I have that, you know, kind of, you know, in, in my mind now. So the next time a decision maker uh, comes and says, you know, we're looking at these, you know, projections, where do you think? And I say, ah, I, there's somebody I can put you in touch with. So it's kind of a back and forth, an iterative process. Um, we do work with, you know, a lot of the national laboratories, NASA, a lot of the, um, we work with WHO, um, UN OCHA. Um, oftentimes, what we are up against there is these are already models that have been established and basically this is the model that we're going to use and then it becomes pdc's job to understand the model understand the uncertainty and goes back to the first question how do we communicate that level of uncertainty to the decision maker so it's it's driven largely by the stakeholder and driven largely by their needs um as a you know former researcher i'd love to get into you know the weeds of you know the most complex new cutting edge model but if that's not going to cut it and that's really not what the decision maker needs then we can use a simpler more straightforward you know in or out of an exposure zone for example not you know projecting of those exposed you know how many are you know particularly vulnerable to certain after effects of a of a disaster thanks thanks much uh, we do have a, another question for for either or, bo or both of you. Uh, the question's posed as follows. Uh, it seems that uh, your models and modeling efforts are focused on or and or rely upon uh, real-time or near real-time decision making. Uh, do you have ideas on how uh, your past models could be used in training environments for uh, for training environments to train for the next uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Sure. So, you know, in support of HHS, uh, one of the groups within HHS that we help is their exercise group. And exercises are a great way for people to, to learn. And so I've always said, you know, nobody's born uh, a great modeler. And it, it, it's complex to look at these models and to understand their results uh, and the implications. And so one good way for people to build their intuition is really through exercises. And so when we help support HHS, you know, we create scenarios, we create outcomes, and people sit there and, and you know, sometimes we kind of feed them data, you know, a couple days at a time that says, you know, this is the number of cases that we're seeing right now. Uh, what are some things that you want to do? Or, you know, what kind of data or what other information would help you guys make your decisions? Um, and so it's kind of a learning process. Uh, we'd love to have them for just more than a couple hours during these exercises. We'd love to have them for days and weeks and, and help them. Uh, but exercises are a great way to do a bunch of what if scenarios, you know, um, and like Joe was saying, uh, sometimes we have to layer disaster upon disaster. Uh, so at the federal government, you know, uh, we're not always happy with doing one scenario. Sometimes we kind of make a joke and say there's a super scenario. So, you know, uh, sometimes there'll be uh, one disaster piled on top of another disaster. And sometimes you'll laugh at it. But, you know, if we push it and, and allow people to think of what are some really bad things that can happen, they can kind of walk their way through logistically how they might respond. So uh, exercises are, are, are a great way for, for people to kind of uh, tackle a problem kind of in a safe environment, um, especially with COVID and, you know, uh, emerging infectious diseases. So I, Sid hit the nail right on the head. Exercises are key. Um, we have an exercise group here at PDC, and we do use these models and model outputs um, to create different scenarios. And as Sid says, oftentimes we pile things on top of individuals so they can kind of, and I think uh, we'll, we'll hear fewer complaints moving forward because <laughs> when we do this, we kind of layer disaster upon disaster and we get these cyber glances off and are you really come on don't do that to me I, I think maybe at least in the the short term we'll have a little little less of that but 
that's absolutely a great observation. Uh, this question: um, How do we use these, you know, real-time decision-making tools, and how do we get comfortable with them? And I think another thing that that Sid um, mentioned is, you know, nobody's born a modeler, and there's also an art to these models and understanding kind of, you know, what you can do with it, you know, kind of how you can play with these parameters to understand how you can make a better decision is key. And I think the best way to do that is through exercises. So we have an exercise group that works uh, with all of our stakeholders upon request. Um, and we can, you know, focus on any number of hazards, but I think that's the key to understanding and utilizing all this, you know, practice the way you play. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Trina, did you want to uh, share some final comments and and um, and close uh, close the webinar? Just in closing, I'd like to thank you, Sean, for serving as our moderator and thank Dr. Bacham and Dr. Green for sharing your expertise with us today. Thanks so much to our great audience for hanging in there with us for the past hour. Um, we know people are extremely busy right now. So thanks again. Take care. Stay well and have a great rest of the day. Thanks again.